Chapter 8. Alenval Voluntary Gifts. Revealed at Medina. Ten sections, 75 verses. As this chapter deals with the Battle of Badr, first battle with which the Muslimin had to fight, it goes under the name of Anfal, which means literally voluntary gifts, though it has also been applied to gangs acquired in war, or what is generally called spoils of war. I prefer, however, the literal significance of the word. The battle had to be fought, yet the Muslim state had, at that time, no treasury, nor any arsenal, nor an army. Voluntary gifts were therefore called for, and not only this battle, but all the succeeding battles, which al Muslimin had to fight, were carried on only by voluntary gifts. You know, the obligatory alms wasn't allowed for this effort. Um, the opening verses of the chapter lend support to the significance as there we are told how the Muslimin should prepare themselves for war. The chapter opens with certain statements necessary to a preparation for the battle, among which are the giving of free gifts, settling up of all internal differences, and being lowly and humble before God. The latter part of the first section and the second section deal with the battle of better. The third section points out the way to success, the essence of which is obedience and faithfulness to the Holy Prophet, which the companions unwaveringly exhibited in this battle under the most trying circumstances. The fourth section refers to the successive to the success, to the successful issue of the war, after pointing out the plans of the opponents against the prophet, it states out that the Muslimin will be made the guardians of the sacred mosque at Mecca, and that disbelievers will no more have any access to it. Well, it will be a rule that they're not supposed to. Um, but certainly, um, the fifth refers to the great value of the success in the Battle of Badr as a sign of the Prophet's truth. As regards numbers, the Muslimin were only a third of the number of their opponents, and as regards the efficiency of this small force, which consisted mostly of old men and raw and inexperienced youths. It was nothing as compared with the strong and sturdy Meccan warriors. The sixth indicates that success did not depend on numbers and weapons, but the seventh proceeds to show that the battle had completely undermined the enemy's strength, referring in conclusion to the treaties of peace which the Arab tribes now sought to establish with the Muslimin, but which later on they frequently violated. The eighth section directs the Muslimin to be ready to deal a blow, and to be well equipped, because they could only hope to secure peace by strength and readiness. The ninth informs them that they will have to fight against even ten times their number, and thus really gives them to understand that they must be prepared to meet overwhelming numbers. The last section explains how far these Muslims should be assisted, who had chosen to remain with their polytheistic brethren, laying emphasis on the sacredness of treaties made even with unbelieving tribes. The Battle of Badr, which forms the chief topic of this chapter, is frequently referred to as al furqan or the Criterion in the Holy Quran, and has already been referred to as such in the third chapter in the historical order of the events of this ch chapter. It should have taken place after the second chapter, but owing to its peculiar nature as affording proof of the truth of the Prophet, the prophet's mission, it finds its proper place after a full discussion of prophethood in the last chapter, and thus affords an illustration in the prophet's own life of the discomfiture which overtakes the opponents of the prophet, as illustrated by the reverence uh, by the reference to the histories of earlier prophets in the last chapter. The major portion was undoubtedly revealed either immediately before or immediately after the Battle of Badr, i.e. in the second year of the Hijra, but the concluding verses 
of the seventh section and the eighth section containing as they do clear re uh, references to the repeated violation of agreements by the disbelievers must have been revealed during the period preceding the conquest of Mecca or possibly in that immediately following as these violations ultimately led to the destruction uh, to the declaration of immunity which finds expression in the chapter that follows verses 30 to 35 which are supposed by some to have been revealed at Mecca are really references to past histories to which attention is called to encourage al Muslimin under new difficulties and is at verse 35 that points out the issues with people who invent their uh, religious services without grounds. It also shows the different. It also points out the difference between um, playing music in prayer. Chapter 9, al Ra'at, the Immunity, revealed at Medina, 16 sections, 129 verses. The title of this chapter is taken from the opening statement, which contains a declaration of immunity from obligations with such of the idolatrous tribes as had repeatedly broken their engagements. This declaration is one of the most important events in the history of Islam, for hitherto the Muslimin had constantly suffered, well, went through hardship, from the hostility of the unscrupulous, idolatrous tribes who had no regard for their treaties, mingling a blow at al Muslimin whenever they had an opportunity of doing so. The chapter is known under various other names. Al Tauba, our repentance, being the best known. This is not really a new chapter, and this accounts for the Bismillah being committed from the opening. It is admittedly part of the last chapter, while a distinct name has been assigned to it by reason of the importance of the Declaration of Immunity, from which it takes its name, a reference to the seventh and the eighth sections of the last chapter, will show that the idolaters repeatedly broke the agreements which bound them to remain on peaceful terms with al-Muslimin. This frequent violation ultimately led to the declaration of immunity, because it is impossible that the Muslimin should be bound forever by the terms of those agreements, while their enemies could repudiate them with impunity. Well, could violate them is probably the better way to phrase that. Um, a declaration of immunity necessitated by the repeated treaty violations of the idolaters, or some of them, I guess, weren't idolaters, but the word mushrik, um, disassociator, mushrikin, um, is made in the first section, with two clear exceptions, one in the case of those tribes who had remained true to their obligations, and the second for the case of the misassociators who sought protection from al muslimin the latter were to be conducted safely to their tribes and were not to be molested, you know, uh, violated in any way. You know, it, it has implication nowadays that wasn't implied really. Um, well, in any way would have been, you know, implied. But the second section gives the chief reason for freeing al Muslimin from the liabilities of certain advancements, again stating expressly that the Muslimin were to stand firm by their agreements so long as the other party adhered to their terms. In the third section, the idolaters are told that there are pretensions relating to the entertainment of the pilgrims and the repairing or building the sacred house could not save them from the consequences of their evil deeds, while the conclusion of that second call is attention to the sacrifices which al Muslimin would now be required to make and the cause of truth. The fourth section states how Islam was triumphing in Arabia, while the fifth, after speaking of falling off of the Jews and the Christians from the pure monotheism of their great prophets, predicts the final triumph of Islam, the only religion of pure monotheism in the whole world.
and Islam, of course, meaning the only religion that has preserved its purity. Thence forward to the end, with the expression of the last three sections, are contained references to the Dubuque expedition, and particularly to those that have been guilty of default in joining that expedition. Thus the hypocrites are, had made their presence clearly felt among al muslimin from the time of the Battle of Uhud in the third year of the Hijra, and they had been given a chance up to that, the close of the ninth year to mend their ways, and the final word with regard to them was now urgently needed. The three concluding sections are a natural sequel to the sequel to the subject of hypocrisy. The fourteenth speaks of the faithful and the fifteenth of their duty towards God and this prophet, and the intention being drawn in the closing words of this section to the necessary proper arrangements for the propagation of the faith. Thus, at the end of a chapter which almost entirely deals with treaty obligations, ultimatums, and wars, the faithful are told that every Muslim community must contribute men to carry the message of truth to the whole world, which was the real object of Islam. The last section speaks to the Prophet's great anxiety for the hypocrites as well as the believers. The whole of this chapter was revealed in the ninth year of the Hijra, the opening verses belonging to the close and the major portion to about the middle of that year, during or after the Tabuk expedition which took place in the ninth of Rajab, in the ninth year of the Hijra. And it's interesting, the you got four mentions of, you know, got you got four verses there, love by and for God. You got four verses indicating surah, so it's a structure and there's a firmness. But we're there's still a of a, a feeling to it, a, an emotion to it. And chapter nine, like chapter eight, indicates the importance of guidance and intention, particularly when it comes to what's explicitly known as worship. Chapter 10, Enos, Jonah. Reeled at Mecca, 11 sections, 109 verses. All that is said in this chapter of Jonah, after whom it is named, is an incidental reference to his people having benefited by the warning. There are more detailed references to Noah and Moses, but in selecting Jonah's name for the title, there seems to be a hint that, as the people of Jonah benefited by his warning, so would the Arabs ultimately believed in the prophet. The chief feature of this chapter is that, while it asserts the truth of Revelation, it also lays stress on the merciful dealings of the divine being with humans. It opens with a statement of the truth of divine revelation in the Holy Quran, and this is the subject discussed in the first two sections. The second section closes with a demand for a sign on the part of the disbelievers, and they are told that judgment is deferred for a while. The reason being given in the third section, where it is shown that divine dealing with men is characterized by mercy, and therefore he does not hasten punishment. The fourth section tells us that evidence of his mercy exists in nature, for he grants gifts which is not in the power of anyone else to grant. And as material gifts from him are characterized by uniqueness, so is his gift of revelation, and the like of it cannot be produced by anyone else. The fifth section states that the reprobate must ultimately meet with their punishment, while the sixth again as if the fifth section, uh, while the sixth again calls attention to the preponderance of the quality of mercy in the divine being, and the seventh contrasts the believers with the disbelievers. The eighth and ninth sections refer briefly to the histories of Noah and Moses. The tenth states, by a brief allusion to Jonah, that those who heed the warning will benefit, and the last section shows that all good is controlled by the divine being. Hence, man must turn to him. And you know, remember all these gender neutrals and stuff, we're not calling God male. We're not saying that when we use the royal we, that, you know, there's a, you know, Godhead or in any, in any way, um, plurality and divinity or different personages or, you know, however you're going to phrase that, you know, we're not meaning that. 
and the man, the he, and all that. This is addressing everybody, you know, the gender-neutral masculine. But anyway, it's the first chapter of the Aleph Lam Ra group that belongs to the last Beckon period. And chapter 11, food. Revealed at Mecca, 10 sections, 123 verses. The name of this chapter is taken from that of the prophet Hud, whose history is narrated, is referred to herein. It, he seems to have been the first prophet to a people living in the Arabian Peninsula. The opponents are warned first, and the truth of the revelation is asserted in a second section, and the opponents are challenged to produce 10 chapters like it. A cruel and persecuting enemy is then warned of the evil fate of previous people. The third and fourth sections deal with the history of Noah, the fifth with that of Hud, the sixth with that of Saleh, the seventh with that of Abraham and Lot, and the eighth with that of Shu'ab. The ninth section compares the wrongdoers and the righteous, and the tenth comforts the believers. The chapter seems to be a complement to the last, which deals mostly with abstract questions relating to the truth of Revelation. While this illustrates the truth of those questions by referring to the histories of former prophets, it is wholly a Meccan revelation and must be placed about the same period as the last chapter. And some people have claimed through the Devil's Quran or something or some other attempt that ten chapters have been brought like it. Well, ten chapters have been brought, but linguistically it falls through. Um, the thematic weaving and lack of jumbling, per se, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, the attempts fall through on different levels as a piece of literature, at the very least. Um, in terms of sound and numbers, too, it fall, but anyways. Chapter 12, Yusuf. Joseph. Revealed at Mecca, 12 sections, 111 verses. This chapter receives its title from the story with which it deals. The entire chapter gives a continuous account of the history of Joseph, the first three verses and the concluding section, both pointing to the purpose which underlies the story. It is not, in fact, a mere narrative, but foretells the ultimate triumph of the holy prophet who was to be turned out of his native city and also the final submission of those who were plotting against his very life. The chapter deals with three kinds of vision, viz. the vision of a prophet, Joseph, which pointed to his ultimate triumph and the triumph of truth, verses 4 and 100, the vision of a king relating to the material welfare of those under his care, verses 43 to 49, kind of reminds you of the book of Daniel, isn't it, uh, and the visions of ordinary men relating to their own adversity or prosperity, verses 36 to 41, the grandeur Oh, the grander the purpose, the longer the vision takes for its due fulfillment. Joseph's vision took a whole lifetime. The king's vision, 14 years. While the visions of ordinary men came to immediate fulfillment, a holy prophet doubtless obtained consolation from these facts, as he had before him a very grand object, the reformation first of the Arabs and then of the whole world. In the arrangement of the chapters, the connection of this chapter with the preceding, it, it is clear that chapter deals with histories of several well-known prophets and the fate of their opponents. This prophetically states that mutual dealings of the holy prophet and his enemies would be similar to the dealings of Joseph and his brethren, there being persecution on one side and forgiveness and mercy dealing, uh, a merciful dealing on the other. This chapter belongs to the same period as the other chapters of this group. And it's also interesting that it mirrors itself. And there's another verse elsewhere that talks about um, Joseph, as I occasionally bring up when we get to it. Chapter 13, Al-Ra'ad, the Thunder, revealed at Mecca, six sections, 45 verses. This chapter is named the Thunder from the analogy of the rain. 
which is often likened to Revelation in the Holy Quran as the rain is mercy from Allah. So it's Revelation, yet this rain is accomplished by thunder and lightning. So Revelation is accompanied by warning of punishment, although its real object is to confer benefit. And I could also say it comes with um, experience that is beyond what a human being can produce, uh, you know, of their own. Um, now, there are psychic or experiences, sensual, emotional, psychiatric, um, and those sort of highs, and that comes with it, and it's extraordinary, much like the way of lightning and thunder, um, but the spiritual revelation goes beyond that. It deals with the truth of revelation, and a reference to previous history in the chapter preceding the last is here followed by a discussion as to the fate of the opponents of the Holy Prophet. It opens with an assertion as to the truth of divine revelation, and it points to the numerous signs in physical nature which bear witness to the truth. But, not satisfied with these signs, the disbelievers demand that the punishment with which they were threatened as being their ultimate law fate should overtake them. The second section is a reply to this demand. There is a law according to which nations rise and fall, and the fall of idolaters and the rise of the Muslim nation were to be brought about in accordance with that law. Here it is that the warning is compared to thunder, revelation being rain, the suggestion being that the demand for punishment is as foolish as a desire to be struck by lightning instead of benefiting by rain. In the third section, the disbelievers are told that there is no showing of partiality for one or hatred for another in the divine nature, but that it is in accordance with the divine laws that righteousness brings its own reward, while continued transgression is followed by evil consequences. Well, some of the consequences are evils, the consequences fitting for evil. Um, but, and why should they again and again demand a miracle from without? The real miracles, we are told in the fourth section, are the miracles which work w within men. The second, uh, the satisfaction with the holy book brings to the hearts of the true believers the great transformation which it was to bring about in the world, the moving away of the great mountains which were obstacles to the spread of truth, and the quickening of those who were dead in spirit were the real miracles which a heavenly book should work upon men. This is what al Quran was destined to do, and what it had already effected to a remarkable extent. Opposition, we are told in the fifth section, was destined to fail because truth must spread in the world and prevail over falsehood. The closing section brings in evidence of the progress of truth, which, however slow, was certainly steady. The chapter, like the three sister chapters preceding it, and the two that follow it, was revealed at Mecca in the last Meccan period. And you see sort of a, there's sort of a Taoist uh, Confucian sort of feel of that chapter in a way, you could say. Sort of a alchemical thing. Chapter 14, Ibrahim, Abraham, revealed at Mecca, seven sections, 52 verses. The name of this chapter is taken from Abraham, whose prayer is mentioned in the sixth section, as his prayer speaks of the settling of Ishmael in the wilderness of Paran. The mention of it is meant to be a reminder of the truth of the Holy Prophet whose advent was prophesied by Abraham. The chapter opens with the statement that the Quran is revealed with the object of leading men out of darkness into light and goes on to show that the Mosaic revelation, although given with a similar object, was for particular people. The second section shows that Moses also exhorted his people to accept the truth, but that all prophets had their message rejected at first. The first section maintains that in all cases opposition was at last destroyed. The divine promise to help 
the prophets being brought to fulfillment, and his powerful opponents rendered helpless. That truth is confirmed as the natural sequel is affirmed in the next section, and this is followed by one which shows that by rejecting truth, man brings about his own ruin, for everything is made subservient to man, which establishes the grand truth of divine unity. Here follows Abraham's prayer, expressing his disavowal of polytheism of every sort, with special reference to his descendants through Ishmael, for whom he also prayed. The concluding section states that the end of opposition to truth has always been and always will be failure. The chapter belongs to the same period as the sister chapters of this group, and just like the other prayers that you find, uh, well, the other supplications that you find in the Quran, um, people have certainly um, included these in ritual prayer. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. I've even heard people using that passage in funeral prayers. Chapter 15, The Rock. Revealed at Mecca, six sections, 99 verses. This chapter is named The Rock because of the mention of the dwellers of the rock in verse 80. This fate is mentioned as a warning to those who contemplated the slings of the prophet. Wow promising a complete protection for the message of truth contained in the Holy Quran against all evil designs. It intensifies the warning contained in the previous chapters against those who were bent on its destruction. The last chapter closed by warning the opponents of the end which they were destined to meet. The same subject is continued in the beginning of this chapter because al Quran, which was meant for the welfare of humanity, must be guarded against all evil intentions. Thus, it is in the very first section the grand promise is given that al Quran shall forever be guarded against all corruptions and, of course, against all attempts to annihilate it. In the next section, we are told that all things are controlled by Allah so that the mischief makers cannot inflict any injury on the elect, and the signs of the triumph of truth could already be witnessed. All, all this talk, uh, you know, a lot of the translations talk about not guided, not guided, not guided. This is a quote. No, they are but they're not accepting the guidance. The letter U is in front of it. In the third section, it is stated that the devil has always been opposing the righteous servants, yet his opposition has always been a failure. The next, while promising mercy for the righteous, refers to an incident in Abraham's history as to how he was given the good news of the birth of a son, through whom a great nation was to be blessed. The same messengers also bore to him the news that Lot's people were about to be destroyed because of their great iniquities. The fifth section speaks of the punishment of the guilty people who would not listen to Lot, closing with a reference to Shu'ab, also a descendant of Abraham. Arabs, however, are warned of the fate of a people near home, the Thamud, who dwelt in rocks, and they are told that, all important as the message of al Quran was, their mockery and opposition would not go unpunished. That the chapter was revealed at Mecca is agreed on all hands, but it is generally regarded as being earlier than the other chapters of this group. Chapter 16. It's interesting the way that chapter 15 adds, ends, though. Um, well, upon the certainty, right? That basically you just keep going your whole life. There's always more certainty. But chapter 16, Allahu, the B. Revealed at Mecca, 16 sections, 120 verses. This chapter is very appropriately named the B, because the B, guided by instinct, which is called a revelation in this case, verse 68, gathers together sweet honey from the flowers of all kinds, taking what is best in them, thus producing a beverage of many hues, in which there is healing for men. So divine revelation in the Holy Quran collected what was best in the teaching of all the prophets and presented it in the Holy Quran, which is also declared to be a healing. 1057 for the spiritual diseases of men. The subject matter of this chapter is the same as that of the preceding six chapters of the Aleph Lam Ra group, to which it really forms, as it were, a supplement 
The first section announces the approach of the doom, and then shows by reference the great divine gifts for the physical welfare of man that such a beneficial master could not have neglected his spiritual welfare. The second section, still dwelling upon the benefits which God has conferred upon man in his physical nature, draws attention to man's superiority over the whole of creation, which is made subservient to him. The next two sections lead us again into the domain of prophecy by stating that the deniers will come to disgrace. These are followed by two sections, further explaining the truth of the statements made above and dealing with some of the false excuses of those who rejected the truth. The seventh section shows how human nature revolts against polytheism, and the eighth deals with the iniquities of the deniers which, however a merciful God, is slow to punish. The ninth establishes the necessity of revelation by reference to the working of law and nature, and the tenth shows that all men cannot be the recipients of the, that revelation, but that choice is made of the best. The eleventh speaks of the hour when the opponents will be overthrown, though the punishment is delayed out of divine mercy. The twelfth refers to the evidence of prophets against their people. The thirteenth shows that there is nothing but good that is enjoined by revelation, and thus appeals to human instinct not to reject it. A Quran is next, plainly stated to be a revelation in substitution for the previous revelation. You know, that people put to um, interpolation and fragmentation. The fate of the opponents who persist in rejecting truth is then compared with that of a flourishing town which is made to suffer fear and hunger because of the ingratitude of its people. The chapter is closed by giving the Muslimin certain directions which they must follow in order to become and to remain a great nation. The revelation of this chapter belongs to the last Meccan period, like that of the group which it supplements. The mention in verse 41 and 110 of Muhajirs, you know, immigrants, those, i.e., oh, they can find it, i.e., those who fly away from their homes, has led to think that the, these verses must have been revealed at Medina. It should, however, be noted that the first flight of the Muslimin to escape the severe punishment of the Meccans has taken place as early as the fifth year of the call, but it is more probable that the reference is to the second Muslim exodus from Mecca, which took place before the Holy Prophet's actual departure from that town. Now, it's not saying that immigration is allowed for the sake of, um, you know, joining in, joining in with the gangs and and uh, overthrowing law and order or something like that. That's 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 not the purpose of immigration. Um, and an important thing that we can look at is these references to land to animals. They're us. They're symbolic of us. Um, so how will we take heed in that 